when the worldwide voyage uh, departed, it was important that people back in Hawaii were taking action. And um, the promise to Pai Aina was the method by which this would occur. At this time, I want to call forward uh, to uh, present on this particular topic marine conservationist from the Harold K.L. Castle Foundation. Please welcome Eric Koh. You came from us. We are family. Your blood is my blood. Your bones are my bones. So when you sail, I am with you. These are words that still haunt me almost three years later. They're the words spoken from a Samoan chief at the home of His Highness. Tuyatua Tupua Tamasese Efi before we sailed from Apia during the third leg of the worldwide voyage. They remind us that our story is a line in a much greater narrative given to us by our ancestors. And embedded in the story of Hokulea and the culture that created her is our Pacific story that was almost lost. It's a relationship with the ocean thousands of years old. And it's a story that's still being written for our children and future generations now. But preceding chapters of that story stretch back over 7,000 years with a voyaging diaspora that began in Southeast Asia. And through those millennia, it's fascinating to imagine how many times the scenario played out where an essential question had to be asked and ultimately be acted on. Are we happy with what we have? Or do we gather up the willing, the able, the intrepid to venture out into the unknown and find something better? Like many of us who've been called to sail, I can imagine there were those who couldn't say no because they weren't really saying yes for themselves. So the canoe is a wellspring of hope. It is a platform of courage. It's a vessel of inspiration. It's a home for vision. It's a space of positivity and direction. It's why Hokulea is all of this and more to all of us and more. And I think it's part of her magic that she to this day can hold that space. Though her physical dimensions are small, there's somehow always enough room for everyone. As a crew member, there are a lot of lessons to learn from this space. One is that our ability to take care of each other is a direct reflection of our ability to take care of that space. It takes at least a dozen able-bodied crew to sail Hokulea, living and working in a space of less than 1,000 square feet. Challenges must be met with thoughtfulness, preparedness, respect, kindness. And with only the natural world to guide her, without the comforts and distractions of modern technology out in the middle of nowhere, we viscerally understand our reliance upon the ocean. Just how much we're at the mercy of it and the need to preserve it for our own existence. I can tell you on that canoe, resilience and sustainability are anything but buzzwords. In this way, the canoe becomes a relevant metaphor for our islands, our nations our earth. And after these lessons and experiences, I stepped out of that space transformed with a fundamentally changed view about how I approached and worked with those around me. After that kind of existence, community takes on an entirely different meaning. You may first greet a fellow crew member as a stranger, but I guarantee you, you say goodbye as family. This too is her magic that her ability to inspire brings about our ability to act and a better understanding of how to act. So for us, we were inspired to try to recreate that space programmatically for our ocean, 
called the Promise to the Pai'aina, a promise to our Hawaiian archipelago. It was an act to answer basic questions. During the worldwide voyage with worldwide implications, how are we going to rise to the challenge here at home? And how is the Hawaii Hokulea came home to going to be any better than the one it left behind three years ago? So born of the lessons learned on the canoe, we built a new platform and once again collected the able and intrepid and stood upon it together to work collaboratively toward common destinations. What is it exactly? I know you're dying to know. The promise to pay Aina. is a time-bound collective impact effort during the course of the worldwide voyage. Consisting of over three dozen federal, state, and local ocean management organizations and community groups who developed five commitments based on what our ocean is to us, from which came 10 shared, specific, measurable targets, all of which I'm so proud to say on behalf of this partnership are completed or very nearly so. And what they all represent is a spirit and energy to collaborate at an unprecedented scale and scope for Hawaii's ocean and serve as a story of hope among many across the globe that Hokulea has strung together in her lei Kaupuni Honua. Of course, this is but one small part of the greater impact of the voyage, which in my estimation is, is still too much to understand right now. We're all still processing. Some sleep might help. So what have we learned from the Promise of Pai Aina Ocean Initiative? We've, er we've learned like sailing during the worldwide voyage that the experience has set us on a fundamentally different trajectory. And I'd like to think that these new lines of the narrative will forever change the story that follows. We've realized that while community still matters and that traditional knowledge is still and always will be the key, the lock is changing. Our problems are now more complicated. They're bigger. Other tools like technology, more savvy education programs, they're necessary. And equal necessary is to see that since our problems are shared, so too must be our solutions. We've recognized that all around the world, most certainly including in Hawaii, people are doing great work for our oceans, finding ans answers to tough problems, serving, as, serving their community and their places in the right ways, special mahalo for each and every single one of these partner organizations and community groups for their collective commitment over these past three years. So maybe it's less about a need to create our own solutions now. Maybe it's more a need to seek them out where they already exist and connect them. Throughout the history of voyaging over those thousands of years, it's really been all about a single mission, to raise islands from the sea that can sustain us. Ironically, what we've learned from the worldwide voyage and the promise of the Pai Aina effort it's inspired is that this still hasn't changed. What we've concluded from the worldwide voyage is that this is still their mission. This is why voyaging needs to continue. This is why Hokulea needs to sail forever. And finally, by sailing around the planet, Malama Honua has proven that human ambition can meet the scale of any challenge, however great, and fundamentally change our understanding of what is possible. It certainly has mine. But much, much more importantly, it fundamentally changes our children's understanding of what's possible. My children, Te Alohilani and Kahulili Kainalu, both named after the light of our place, kids throughout Hawaii, and really everywhere, from this day, will have forever take a simple fact that Hokulea sailed around the world. And if our children now know her feats as facts, what will Hokulea now inspire in them? Mahalo.
Big mahalo to Eric uh, Ko. He's just been an amazing ally to have and uh, leader within our community on the Promise to Pai Aina and on crew. Uh, you know, Harold K. Elf Castle Foundation has been extraordinarily generous, but but I think what's been most valuable is the the personal leadership of you and Terry and Mitch and all your team. Uh, so again, thank you very much to Eric Ko. And mahalo as well to Steph and your, your lovely children who kind of took some sac made some sacrifices to allow you to be with us so much. Well, we're going to move into our, uh, continue to move into this promise to Pai Aina by bringing another panel up to the stage. And, and two who would want to be here could not be. Uh, they were two of our ocean elders. And uh, with the timing, if the timing is right, as we move from video to video, we're good. Uh, we'd like to first introduce Prince Albert of Monaco. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the oceans are currently suffering from most of the ills that are affecting our planet. Pollution, global warming, overfishing, exploitation of fossil fuels, the endangering of ecosystems that are the results of our irresponsible model of development. However, the oceans are essential for the equilibrium of our planet and are equally vital for our civilization. Without healthy oceans, the world would be a very different place. Without them, humanity would never have made the progress it has up to now. The link with the oceans is therefore vital. In the true sense of the word, the oceans date back to the very origins of life on Earth and have nurtured all the major stages in our development. We tend to forget this very simple fact. And this is what the wonderful adventure of the Hokulea has just reminded us of in a very timely fashion. By showing how the ancient Polynesians were able to sail across the oceans without any point of reference other than the sky, this exceptional project has not only highlighted how talented these men were, or the courage of those who took up the torch centuries later, it has also helped maintain this, this essential, simple bond that links us to the oceans this bond that we must cherish more than ever as one of our most valuable assets. Through this admirable living example, it has made it possible to turn this often abstract requirement into a simple reality, capable of touching everyone, and in particular the youngest members of society, those who we should teach to respect and to protect our seas. This is what motivates my Ocean Elders friends, who are numerous here today, Sylvia, Jean-Michel, Don, and Gigi, and whom I would like to congratulate. This is what encourages the exceptional crew of the Hokulea. And it is also what guides my actions. As such, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to Naona, Kalepa, and Bruce for this fantastic adventure of Hokulea at this star of gladness. This is why I wanted to send you this message of support, friendship, and admiration today. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. An ocean elder, the Prince of Monaco, Prince Albert. Another ocean elder who could not be with us today, but in spirit, uh, is Richard Branson. Aloha to all of the captains, navigators, and crew of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. I'd love to be with you celebrating the homecoming of Hukalea. I'm always game for a good celebration, especially on a beautiful island filled with aloha. It is amazing to think that it's been nearly four years since you set out on this courageous voyage. In March of last year, I was so honored to host Hukalea at my home as she reached the BBI. It was a magical time for all of us, and before she and her crew set sail northward, we had decided to name our water sports buildings on Mosquito and Mecca Islands, the Eddie I. Cows Water Sports Centers, in honor of the great Hawaiian waterman. I was surprised and humbled to be named as a great navigator of Island Earth by you. A naming that I'm not sure I deserve, um, but I, I'm very, very grateful. It's a great and cherished honor. Your message to care for Island Earth is one that we all must embrace and carry forward long after the end of this voyage. You have met with many people in many countries around the world. You've shared many thoughts and stories. And I do hope that these connections have created long-lasting friendships and have sparked new efforts everywhere to care for the ocean, for nature, and island earth. Anyway, I just want to say, welcome home. 
Richard Branson, ladies and gentlemen. And I know I was sitting there next to Sylvia, and I know he, he cherishes the relationship he has with the Ocean Elders, and we're really pleased to have three of them here today. Let me introduce them and ask them to come to the stage. First, Captain Don Walsh, an oceanographer. Yes, please, give him a round of applause. An oceanographer, explorer, retired Navy captain whose distinguished career earned him a place with the Ocean Elders. In 1960, then Lieutenant Walsh and Jacques Picard dove to the deepest place in the ocean in the Navy's Bathyscaf Trieste. Captain Don is the honorary president of the Explorers Club and in 2001 he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Captain Don Walsh. Our second ocean elder has for five decades continued work initiated by his father to communicate love and concern for our water planet. Jean-Michel is founder and president of the Ocean Future Society for his exemplary public service in ocean conservation through education, awareness, and diplomacy. Jean-Michel was honored with the highest French civilian order of distinction, the Chevalier, Chevalier de, la, de, la, de la Légion d'Honneur, Knight of the Legion of Honor by the President of France, Francois Hollande, in 2016, Jean-Michel Cousteau. It's been a long time since my ninth grade French class. <laughs> Our third ocean elder is a National Geographic Society explorer in residence, founder of Mission Blue and Deep Ocean Exploration and Research, Inc., advisory chair of the Heart Research Institute, and former chief scientist of NOAA. She is an author, lecturer, research scientist, government official, and director of, for several corporate and nonprofit organizations, the president and chairman of Mission Blue, and the Sylvia Earle Alliance, her deepness, Sylvia Earle. We're very honored that President Tommy Romengasau, Jr., ninth president of the Republic of Palau and first Palauan to be elected president four times, is here with us today. Since his first presidential term in 2000, President Romengasau has worked hard to preserve the best and improve the rest uh, for Palau and for generations to come. The good governance of his administration has produced financial stability and earned them and elevated Palau to a place at the international table. His Excellency, President Tommy Romengasau, Jr. <laughs> this side, President Romengasau, thank you. The moderator of this panel is a global leader in her own right and respected friend of many in this room. Aulani Wilhelm's career in natural resource management spans two decades, focused on ocean conservation, and led to Marine National Monument and World Her Heritage Site designation of Papahanao Mokuakea, the largest protected area on Earth and the first of its kind to honor indigenous relationships to the sea. A crew member of Leg 27 of the Worldwide Voyage and Conservation International Senior Vice President for Oceans, Aulani Wilhelm. Oh. And with that, Aulani, I turn the panel over to you. Mahalo, Neil. Is this on? Aloha. You know, this has been an incredible couple of weeks for oceans not only because of our beloved Hokulea coming home along with all of the other canoes and celebrating around the world the canoe and voyaging communities of, of Oceania, but of the world. But the first week of June was an unusual week in the international realm of policy where it was the first time that the United Nations got together to talk about oceans as a tool for sustainable development, the first time that oceans was a focus and it's really because of incredible explorers, leaders, wayfinders, thinkers, and people who have dedicated their lives to oceans, like the four people on the panel here, that that meeting was even possible. That we would even be thinking about at the 
kind of international level to really focus on what is it going to take for a sustainable world. And like Nainoa mentioned earlier, we didn't even talk about sustainability you know, growing up. These are, these are new words and they're critical today, but it's because of the kinds of leadership that we, we have. And so we're gearing up to, to go to the United Nations. And I run into Nainoa in the parking lot of the school. We're dropping our kids off. And he's like, hey, you know, tell these guys the science is accurate. <laughs> right? And it's like, we're in this world where science, as John Slide kind of joked about earlier, is being challenged. Now we know, fueled by the wisdom of our ancestors, we know about that wisdom. And because of the voyaging that you've just heard about er earlier and that you're all part of, we don't question the wisdom and the knowledge of our ancestors anymore. And because Uncle Hector said, I'm gonna prove them wrong, you know, we, we are able to do that. But now science is being questioned. So he said, you know, we went 42,000 miles, 300 communities, 19 countries, and the story's the same. We see the impact of all those things the scientists are telling us on communities, on what's happening in the ocean and the impact on the social fabric of people around the world. It's real. And because of the extraordinary leadership of, of everybody who participated in this voyage, that, w that was seen. It is real and, and, and few, even though that I know points out that's just a thin slice of the earth. But again, if the story is true of these impacts in that slice, what about the rest of the world? But the good news is the stories he shared were, were that the stories of, of hope are also there. And that's what you heard about in Bruce's story and in everybody's story here. And, but he also you know, shared, okay, so what is that role? So tell him science is accurate and because of the great change we're facing, we need science, we need exploration, and we need explorers more than ever in order to be as resilient as we can in the face of this great change. And that's really stuck with me and that's what this panel is about, about the role of exploration, the role of science, and, and, and what does that mean in this world that has seemingly kind of lost its head. So with that, I'd like to start with, as you heard the, the um, the introductions, but with, with Captain Don, you know, people would argue, and I know that when I went on my first exploration as a, a kind of young professional, people said, ah, the best of the, exploration, the explorations are done. There was there left to explore. Tell us about that and how much we need, how, how much that's not, not nearly true and, and, and what does it mean today? Good afternoon. Uh, I've been associated with uh, the world of exploration, literally the world in exploration, for about seven decades. So I've seen a lot of it. So my comments, I think, are qualified by uh, that kind of exposure because of the honorary president of the club, the Explorers Club, uh, I've met all of uh, explorers, all domains, people that crawl through jungles, schlepped across sand dunes, gone to the bottom of the ocean, gone to the moon, and so on. And we have all of this all of us have this one thing in common in the world of exploration, and that's curiosity. That's how I define exploration. It's curiosity acted upon. And we're all born with the exploration gene. If you look at a little baby in its mother's arms, it's exploring the world, looking around. And when the child becomes mobile and can run around, you take to the restaurant and it's going all over the place, pulling gum off the bottom of the tables and testing that. That's exploration. But something happens in the teenage years, and, and in a combination of peer pressure and hormones, it gets beat out of most people. But inherently, we are all explorers. And coming back to the point she made, uh, a lot of people say, and it's a cheap shot, and it's a toss off without any thought, it's all been found. Okay, the big ticket items or whatever, you know, Mount Everest and things like that. But for every one of those, there are thousands and thousands of unanswered, open questions, unanswered questions, especially in the world ocean where we're particularly interested. You've been staring at my first command in the United States Navy, a peculiar thing called a bathyscaphe, uh, which is uh, capable of t taking people to the great depths of the ocean. And I, when I first saw Hokulea, and I started sailing uh, in 1951, uh, in, in sail vessels as well as propelled vessels. And, uh, and so I know sailing vessels. 
but when I saw Hokulea for the first time, I thought, mm, that's, that's a weird one. And I think all of you in this room are looking at my ship, my inner spaceship, and saying, well, that's a weird one too, so we're even. Now, they went 42,000 miles. I only went seven miles, except it was straight down in the deepest place in the ocean. So that's, that's uh, uh, I think we're of a mind here about the importance of exploration and why we need to all be explorers. And you don't have to, uh, you can go in your backyard and be curious about things, but you have to act on curiosity. Every second moment of the day, we're seeing something and say, oh, well, that's interesting. But how many of you say, well, I wonder how it works. Do you dive into a book, you go online, or do you ask a learned person? That's a little more rare, and that's what makes you an explorer, when you act on your curiosity. And, and it's especially important in the world ocean, the largest geographic feature on our planet. Uh, you know, come on in, the water's fine, as they say. We need everybody we can get. As Sylvia has often said, maybe five to 10% of the world ocean has been adequately explored, and we're going to go to Mars. Okay, that's not a bad idea. Sylvia and I were talking about that earlier. That's a one-way trip, isn't it? I bet everyone in this room could build a passenger list of people we'd like to see go on a one-way trip <laughs> to Mars. And so we're, we're all better off for it here on planet Earth. But Marshall McLuhan, who's the great uh, theoretician, philosopher, Canadian, uh, uh, the uh, medium is the message, is one you all know, one of his sayings. He said, on spaceship Earth, there are no passengers. We're all crew. So everyone here has a responsibility. You don't leave it to these uh, true elders because we're all of the, what, our seventh decade or so. We're real elders physically and mentally. We're about 10 years old when we get into the ocean. But you have to all be involved. Don't leave it to us. It's not going to happen. And, and so this is such an inspiration to be here. And, and I'm so honored as an ocean elder to be here with you to get the inspiring messages, uh, not just from the people in charge of the expedition on Hokulea, but the people that did all of the work, the crew members and so on. I was fortunate enough to be here at the Sail Away three years ago, so I'm happy to converge back with this culture and see the end of the voyage. And uh, I thank you very much for in involving me, inviting me. It is a considerable honor to this sailor who's been out of the oceans for 70 years and keep going well, I guess I've asked to be cremated and put it back in the ocean, so that'll be my last voyage. I, not, I don't have any premonition or anything, but uh, I, I was talking to uh, Jean-Michel a minute ago, and, and we're getting these awards. You know, the twilight, you know, the winter of your life, people start giving you stuff. And where were they, where were they when we were really doing important things? Uh, and, and a lot of them, at least I've gotten four of them, are, are uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards. That's very sinister to peop a person my age. I mean, why don't they have a pretty good so far award? I'd feel much better about that. So thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for bringing that humor into the room so we can talk about pretty good so far. I just want to ask you to follow up on that. If you were to... It, <laughs> Pretty good so far. If you were to get that award, and you think about you've been on the ocean 70 years, at what point do you think you were pretty good so far to give people who are younger in their careers some thought about where they should be? You know the answer, but I'll answer it my way. We're all a work in progress. We're never going to get to perfection. I think that's very Buddhist, isn't it? But uh, we'll never get to perfection. But every day, I mean, my mantra uh, 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 every day, I want to know stuff. I want to know stuff. I don't care where this stuff comes from. Uh, if, it's, uh, if I'm up in the mountains, I don't know much about that. And if I'm in the jungles, I want to know what those bugs are. And it's good to be out with, uh, with experts. And, and you, that, I think that's what winds your mainspring. It keeps you alive. You want to know stuff. And then you want to act on it. You find your niche, which you can do well, uh, where you might be educated to do well in that area. And, uh, but I, I don't, you know, it's, a, it's an asymptote, as we say. And, Mathematics, you'll never arrive at this place. Uh, but the journey's the fun. And, and the termination, of course, is when I make my last trip in the ocean. Thank you. Don, you want to be cremated? Is that a match? 
Not yet. You have a match? But I want to know where you want to be dumped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I grew up on San Francisco Bay, and I'd be so happy to uh, maybe put in the ocean right under the Golden Gate Bridge as the tide is ebbing into the sunset. How's that? Okay, I needed to know that because yeah. my, my mother has been cremated. She's right in front of uh, Monaco, where my yeah. father worked. And my brother is buried in the Atlantic Ocean, and I will be in the oh. Pacific. So maybe we can meet there. Huh? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I spent a lot in the polar regions, and so I'm, and I'm a lot of fish out of water or penguin out of breath or whatever. Uh, I've, 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 I've done about 90 expeditions to the Arctic and the Antarctic, and so I, those are places I know. And sometimes I think maybe the uh, Southern Ocean around Antarctic, where I've had some really happy times. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, but anyway, this is kind of a downer, isn't yeah. it? So it's <laughs> <laughs> when you get to be our age, you start thinking dark thoughts, especially at three in the morning. So Jean-Michel. Your family is, is synonymous with the ocean and has brought many, many generations to even beginning to have a, a glimmer of understanding about what 70% of our planet has. And there's so much science out there, but it's the accessibility that your family has known, this niche about making this information kind of about people. That really, when we talk about what we need to do, we say, oh, we need to conserve this or we need to manage this, but really, it's about people and about humans being part of nature, but sometimes forgetting that part. And so how about a, a few thoughts on the nature of humans? Well, because of my father's curiosity, he ultimately, in order to keep up with his colleagues, uh, who were spare fishermen, he couldn't film them long enough to catch when they were catching fish. So that's when he uh, co-invented the regulator and the equipment which freed him to go and start filming underwater. Uh, very young, together with my mother, my brother, and my dad and I, as kids, we were in the ocean all the time. And at the age of seven, uh, when he had co-invented the equipment, he tested the equipment on my mother first <laughs> in Paris, in a river called La Marne, which is a lot of pollution there, it's horrible. And she came out and he said, okay, that, this is gonna work now. <laughs> and then he put a tank on my back and my brother and my mother and every weekend we were in the ocean. We were in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, we started exploring, 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 and I can never stop telling you the excitement that I have had the privilege of living for the last 72 years since he pushed me overboard. <laughs> and uh, I will never stop because, you know, if you want to be preserved, I found out that's where they put salt, right? Uh, in sardines. So that's why I dive, 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 and uh, I will be diving the day after tomorrow. <laughs> but thanks to uh, his expeditions exploring the planet before and after with uh, Calypso in 1952, uh, 53, and then going all over the planet, uh, I had the privilege of spending three, four, five months on the ship instead of being in school every year. And uh, I've had the privilege of exploring the planet and visiting many parts of the, uh, the ocean and many islands all over the planet. And uh, thanks to my better half, Nancy was right here. Uh, we met in Hawaii, in Maui. And that was a way for me to be connected with a very important culture although I've always been inspired by cultures all over the planet. But the Hawaiian culture, for me, became a very important part. And thanks to these connections, ultimately, I ended up being connected with Nainoa. And Nainoa, you very special to me for many, many reasons. And I just want to uh, 
emphasize the fact that when I listened to you and found out from your family history and what your father did to you, and I realized what my father did to me, I realized that we have connections which are very interesting because your passion made us connect everyone on the planet thanks to the ukulele. My father made me want to connect with everyone on the planet so we understand how connected we are to below the surface of the ocean. And uh, we all depend upon that part of the world. And I was so touched when uh, I had the pleasure of seeing you when I was in American Samoa and visiting the ukulele at the time and the people and uh, other cultures which are very similar in many ways. And I'd like to uh, pay respect and honor with this great time we had. If we can have the little video that I put together when we were in American Samoa. And the sail plan around the world is 47,000 miles, it's 26 crew changes, it's uh, 28 countries, it's 62 islands, it's 82 ports. It's, it's an extensive voyage. But we didn't believe it could be a Hawaii voyage. It needed to be a Pacific voyage. So that we're spending, of the 36 months of this voyage, 14 of the first months are in the Pacific intentionally. We begin it in Hawaii, we go to Tahiti, our ancestral homeland, for permission from our elders. But this arrival in American Samoa, uh, for all of us, uh, is, is essential because it's family, but it's a very special family. When you look at the migration periods of, of, of how the Polynesians came here from a scientific point of view, they came out of Melanesia and they worked east into Western Polynesia and that the first oceanic jump was to Fijian Islands but the longest voyage between islands was only 87 miles. But once you got to Samoa, then the jump into Eastern Polynesia is it now is hundreds of miles and it's basically upwind. And they stayed in Samoa for about a thousand years. But at some time in that history, and we don't know, there was an enormous amount of courage and, and brilliance that um, somebody or some people in Samoa finally uh, cracked the code that they built the, the spaceship of our ancestors, the deep sea voyaging canoe, that could allow them to have the tool and the home and the craft to be able to go upwind and then get to the islands of Eastern Polynesia, Tahiti, Cook Islands, eventually to Aotearoa, to the Tomo, to Archipelago, to Rapa Nui, and then to Hawaii. Um, but at the same time, the other piece that they had to have done within that whole powerful time of brilliance is that someone had to figure out how to use the heavens and the atmosphere and the winds and the oceans and the waves and the currents. Someone had to figure out how to navigate. Uh, and the system that we have learned is thousands of years old from my teacher that was passed down generation after generation in the oral tradition. Um, it is extraordinary. And so coming to Samoa really is, uh, it's coming to our elder brother from Hawaii so that if we are the youngest culture in some ways from the deep sea navigation uh, perspective, they are the elder brother. And so coming here with humility, coming here with respect to Samoa and asking for permission to go because uh, we need that. Thanks to what you have done with your team, what my father has done uh, with our team and what we continue to do after he passed away and I created Ocean Future Society to honor his philosophy. I want every human being on the planet to realize we are connected to the ocean one way or another, whether you live along the coastline or you live on top of a mountain. And next time you drink a glass of water, you're drinking the ocean. And next time you ski or have fun, you're playing with the ocean. 
And uh, we all depend upon the quality of that ocean for the quality of our lives. And that is our mission. And having had the privilege of connected with Ukulea, I realize how connected we are, whether it's above water or below water, and the fact that you have done what you have done has given me very emotional hope and desire and wishes. And I woke this morning, thanks to my better half, Nancy Nan, uh, we woke in the, in the, for breakfast and uh, I read Makahana Ka Ika, which means knowledge is gained by doing. We need to do. We need to stop just talking. We need to connect every one of us with our life support system. And we have the privilege of living what I call the communication revolution. I was in India not very long ago and met people in a room who were asking questions not about India, but about the rest of the planet. We, as a human species, we are all connected with each other. And if we want, we have the immense privilege of deciding not to disappear. We're the only privileged species on the planet that has that power. And I believe we can, and that's why we'll never give up and keep diving to connect and bring young people through our educational program, Ambassador of the Environment, which is being spread more and more all over the planet. But seeing those kids this morning, for me, recharge my batteries in a way which I really believe that the decision makers of tomorrow will make much, much better decisions than we have made. And that's because we are now in a position where we can pass on the information. I remember my father saying, people protect what they love. And I keep saying, how can you protect what you don't understand? Let's not forget that when it comes to the ocean, we've explored very little of it, maybe five, 10% of it. We're protecting very, very little of it. And there are probably thousands and thousands and thousands of species that have yet to be discovered. How can you protect them if you don't know them? So exploring, discovering, and passing on the information is very critical. And having those generations of young people coming to share and with their parents and educate their parents and grandparents, which they do today, thanks to this communication system. My dream, Nainoa, is to get the ukulea in the book 23, where you have, for the first time ever, the great majority of all the nations of the planet to decide to get together and start to face up and take decisions about the climate issue, which we all depend upon and was mentioned so well by other people earlier. We can do it, Nainoa. We need to get the ukulea in Germany to celebrate the Fijian Park 23 in November. We need to find people who are going to make that happen and reconnect the fact that the ukulea has connected the entire planet together like we have tried, my father has tried, and we all depend upon that environment. That is, I know, a challenge, but if we can do anything about it, we need to do it, we need action, action, action now. So if we protect, our planet, if we protect the ocean, we protect ourselves. That is our choice. Thank you for what you've done. You've recharged my batteries in a way you have no idea. I will never, never stop. Thank you. Feeling a planning meeting coming on. Dieter, are you up for that? Germany. <laughs> Jean-Michel, wow. So 
Dr. Earl, if you want to respond to any of these things, I don't want to, you know, don't want to be this trying to facilitate something, you know, awkwardly. So I just want to leave you the floor. You, I remember you speaking once, and and you know, I've heard you speak many, many times, and through my career, have always been an incredible inspiration. And you, your voice has been one of the first loudest but most elegant voices to tell people that the stability of all life on the planet depends on the stability of life in the oceans. You're one of the most courageous and bold voices. You've done this in science. You've done it when you were at NOAA. You've done it through education. And you've always done it with such elegance and such hope. How throughout your life, as you've seen the changes and the great changes, have you maintained that? And, and what, what advice do you want to leave with all of these incredible people who are part of this voyaging community and beyond? So I once heard Jean Michel's, Michel's father say that he wished he could take his children, that would be you, to see places that he had known as a child, but he couldn't because the world had changed so much. And I've heard Jean Michel say the same thing about his children. And ironically, I've now heard your children <laughs> say the same thing. It just keeps seemingly to be on a, we're on a pathway toward inevitable, maybe not, but certainly we're on a, a general decline that is taking place in a few generations. So, I think that brings us to the crossroads. Are we going to continue in this track so that your children's children say the same thing? <laughs> oh, I wish I could take my kids to see what I knew as a child. I can't because it's gone. I tell people, in fact, that I come from a different planet. <laughs> and some of my friends say, I knew that. <laughs> But I mean it, I come from a planet that was so different from the planet that now exists that it's hardly recognizable. Oh, well, there are lots of things that are. Before I dive into my thoughts on that, I want to borrow that phrase from Don Walsh. Nainoa, pretty good job so far. <laughs> All of you voyagers, you Hokulia participants and champions, pretty good job so far. <laughs> but why are we here right now to see what's next? To see where the voyage will continue? This is not the end by any means. It's just the jump start toward whatever can happen from this point forward. It was such a pleasure to be here with some of the rest of you present company included <laughs> on the stage, to launch the great worldwide voyage and now to be here for the homecoming. It is such a lift, all those concerns that were voiced at the time of the launch, all the dangers along the way. And I, I love the comment I know about the biggest danger was staying at the dock of not launching forth, of not taking on the challenge, of not facing our fears. The biggest fear is that we are going to continue this dreadful track year after year, generation after generation of being witnesses to decline of the natural world that, that makes our existence possible. I've also had the great fun of, from time to time, talking with you, Nainoa, about what's under the canoe. What is under the canoe? <laughs> because you're skimming along the surface, looking at the stars, navigating by the stars, 
driven by currents, the wind, and your intellect. And what's under the canoe? That's the juicy part of the planet, the, the, the ocean, the blue part of the planet. Well, I have not been as deep in the ocean as Don Walsh. Only two other people can make that claim. Well, there may be others who've made that descent but not returned. They're still there. It's coming back that matters, right? <laughs> round trips. <laughs> like the round trip to Hawaii. <laughs> But I have had the fun of using dozens of different little su submersibles of one sort or another, piloted a few, thousands of hours diving, living underwater 10 times in little underwater laboratories, getting to know fish personally, the way people get to know their neighbors, <laughs> getting to see that every fish, every clam, every sponge, every living thing is unique. I mean, all with personalized DNA. We know that about ourselves, but most people don't think about cats, dogs, horses, birds, and jellyfish, similarly as unique individuals. But all of us share that common chemistry of life. I'm mindful of the astronomer, astrophysicist, really, Carl Sagan, who once remarked, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. Think about that. <laughs> if you want to build the Hokulea from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. You have to think where did all of this come from? It hasn't always been this way. And nothing that we experience today will ever be again. We're a part of this journey, this eternal journey. Respect for your elders, maybe present company excluded, <laughs> our real elders are way back there in time. Ed Wilson, another of those who are known as ocean elders, has remarked that we really should be thinking about the microbes <laughs> as our true elders. And microbes rule the world, they rule our bodies, they rule the ocean, develop the very conditions of chemistry that make Earth hospitable, not just for us, but for the rest of life on Earth, as we now know it. It was also Carl Sagan who remarked that we're all made of stardust. Think of that as you float under the Golden Gate Bridge, Don. <laughs> and be aware that we're all tied together and we're all stardust one way or the other. Respecting your elders, tracing your ancestry, understanding that we're a part of nature, not apart from it. One of my fellow explorers in residence at the National Geographic, the director of the pyramids, Zahi Hawass, Egyptian, of course, he says, if you do not know your past, you cannot know your future. Huh? Here we are, diving into the past, trying to shape a future, and realizing it's evident right here in this room. We are all indigenous to the same blue island, Earth. It's home for all of us. We need to enhance the respect and learn from those cultures that have had the privilege of learning, staying in one part of the planet for long enough to really develop respect for what it takes to keep us alive. And that's true of the Polynesian culture. It's true of the cultures of the high north. It's true of the cultures in Australia, South Africa, throughout Africa, in India, China, throughout the world. The deep history that people have shared by staying more or less in an area long enough to really sense the rhythms of time and become adjusted 
to knowing how to prosper within the framework of what's available to you. Well, so much has changed so quickly as humans have developed technologies that cut us loose from our deepest roots and enable us to travel far from our points of origin. We are right now, all of us, at a crossroads in time. Never before could we know what we now know about who we are, about where we've come from, or most importantly, maybe where we might be going. Never again is it likely that we'll have a chance as, as good as what we now have to be able to take us from this, this depressing time of loss to a time of recovery, a time when we really, as a, a civilization, understand that we must respect the knowledge of those who preceded us, apply it within the framework of our new technologies, mostly understand our true elders, <laughs> the rest of life on Earth. Whenever I dive into the ocean, it is like diving into the history of life on Earth. You know, we are just such a tiny piece of the great spectrum of life. We're among the largest creatures on, plan on the planet, the upper few percentage in terms of size. Most of life on Earth I mean, creatures that are no bigger than your thumb, most of them much smaller than your thumb. So diving into the sea, when you look at the plankton, oh, it's, you see a cross-section of life, sometimes in a bucket of water. You may see as many divisions of animals in the plankton as there are occupying all of the land together. There's some 30 or 35 divisions of animal life that we have identified so far, you can find 14 or 15 of those divisions, mostly young stages, swimming around in plankton. Certainly in coral reefs, you can see diversity much greater than even the richest rainforest. Only about half of all of those major divisions of animal life occur on all the land put together. The ocean is where the action is, not just in terms of diversity, but also in terms of abundance. It's the biosphere. It's the part of the planet that we seriously must address with the greatest respect. As Jean Michel says, every glass of water you drink, every, <laughs> every breath you take, we're connected to the ocean. And we've neglected and not respected the ocean. So, here's the thing. The collision of circumstances that we now face, we know more now than ever before in history because every generation we learn more, pass it along, learn more, pass it along. So the 10 year olds of today are armed with incredible insight that no one early in the 20th century could possibly know because no one had been high in the sky looking back and seeing Earth in perspective. It was only a few hundred years ago that a few scientists had a really hard time trying to convince the rest of the world that Earth was really not the center of the universe. And we're still having a hard time getting some people to realize they're not the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge is there. There's no excuse anymore for complacency. There's so much evidence all around us of the changes. We could not know when I was a kid that humans had the capacity to, due to the atmosphere, due to the ocean, due to the planet, set in motion processes that would cause the melting of polar ice. It just seemed inconceivable that we could change the chemistry of the ocean through acidification. The ocean seemed like the logical place to dump things that we did not want close to where we live. The ultimate place to dispose of things, deep six, whatever we didn't want. And it's still happening. Even though we know better, we're not doing better. 
we're still looking at the ocean as a place to discard things. The ocean is a wash in our junk. Plastics seem to be dominating the scene, at least in the minds of many, and that too is a yeah, plastics are newcomers on the planet along with us. More recent arrivals, they've only been around for about 50 years, owing to the, our genius of creating them. But we never thought that we'd have to think about how do we make them go away. <laughs> you know, there is in, in a civilization that's in cultures that have been around for thousands of years, there is no such thing as waste. Everything goes back into the earth and has a new life. Or you take care of what you have. You don't wantonly destroy. If you do, your survival in your lifetime or that of your children could be at risk. You learn that when you sit or stay in more or less a, a localized area for long enough to realize you've got to take care of the natural systems that take care of you. Well, we're all together in this small blue island. And the lesson is the same. Whether you're from Polynesia, the high north, or any of the other deep-rooted cultures, why is it taking us so long to learn the lesson that we have to take care of the natural world that takes care of us? We're the only creatures who have been so extravagant in our use of the natural world. So complacent about the cost of our prosperity. I'm mindful <laughs> that we are the only ones who can know that we are extravagant, that we can see, we can measure, we can document, we have the evidence of what we're doing to our little blue island earth. I've had the privilege in my lifetime of being with a lot of creatures who are at least as old as I am, and some significantly older, turtles, sharks, some birds live a very long time, and they have been witnesses to the changes just as I have, just as you have. They don't know why the changes are occurring. They don't know why there are fewer fish, fewer squid, why it's harder to make a living as a seabird or as a sea-going turtle or a shark. Don't know why numbers are changing, but we know why. We can look in the mirror, every one of us, and understand what's causing these changes. We also, unlike any of the other creatures on Earth, as smart as elephants are, as smart as dolphins are, and I know some pretty smart fish too, I can tell you, that we're the only ones who not only have caused the problems, we're the only ones who can solve the problems. And this is maybe the sweet spot in time, when before we could not know what we now know, but another 50 years, it'll be too late to take actions that are now possible. I said 10 years ago <laughs> that the next 10 years will be the most important in all of the next 10,000 years, the changes we make, the decisions we make will either take us this way or that way, but now is the time. Well, I'll say it again today, the next 10 years will be the most important in the next 10,000 years. It just gets harder and harder because doors are closing, species are disappearing. We're, we've already lost 90% of the sharks, despite your good efforts, President Tommy. Sharks are in trouble, but they've got some champions. We still have 10% of the sharks. They're not all gone. We still have a few bluefin tuna swimming around in the ocean. But we may be the last ones who have the opportunity to know what bluefin tuna tastes like, let alone know how they swim, how they master the fine art of propelling themselves through the ocean at a speed faster than a nuclear submarine, capturing the energy with greater than 90% efficiency as they swish their tail back and forth. Human engineers eat your hearts out. 
and especially if we lose a chance to learn from the tunas and the swordfish and the sharks and the jellyfish and all those other creatures who are at risk because of our actions. So, here's the thing. Huh. Last week, I was at a conference at the National Geographic. It was all about, ta-da, exploration. But the main focus has been the topic of several big articles with the National Geographic. And the topic in the minds and hearts of many people these days, it seems, let's go to Mars. Let's, let's terraform that other planet. Let's have an escape route for humankind as we leave this planet in, in bad repair. Let's find another planet to uh, do unto it <laughs> some way that we would not wish to do unto ourselves. As Don Walsh mentioned, uh, Elon Musk has this master plan, investing billions, it'll probably be more than billions before he's through, to populate Mars with, well, he's aiming for about 50,000 people, and he wants to do it in his lifetime, and I suspect he has to hurry if that's going to happen, but um, yeah, the idea of we could all have our secret list of who should go. <laughs> haven't figured out how to get people back. But here's the thing. Whatever these dreams and schemes of going to Mars are all about, it shows a profound lack of respect for what we have here. Four and a half billion years of fine tuning to get us to a place where life is pretty good for humankind. And we expect to replicate that somewhere else so that we can set up housekeeping on another planet that does not have an ocean does not have the millions of neighbors or fellow species that generate oxygen, take up carbon, maintain the chemistry of the planet without us having to do very much except to take care of it. Our life support system is a living ocean. Of course, the creatures on the land as well. But I suspect we could get by without rainforests as long as the ocean remained intact. Well, neither is the case these days. We've made great inroads into both the land and the sea. But the gift of our time that should cause, be cause for hope is that now we know. Now we know what we could not know even 10 years ago, let alone a 100 or a 1,000 or 10,000 years ago. We can see ourselves as never before. And we have an opportunity as never again. Often in explorer circles, T.S. Eliot comes up with his nice little series of lines about how we will not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's rather where we are right now, beginning to know the place for the first time. And beautiful Hokulea, making full circle, voyaging into the unknown, coming back, knowing perhaps now for the first time, where do we go from here? Nainoa, you've given us hope. And I know you and the many people you have touched, you are symbolic of that network that goes back thousands of years, all the way back to the beginning, those mighty microbes that are with us still, and that we need to respect just as we respect not just the elders, but the kids who are with us now, who embody what comes next. The idea that we can give them the gift, the enhanced gift of knowing, it isn't too late to turn things around. This is a moment in time as never before, and maybe as never again. Thanks. President Ramengasau, 
I, I watched you at the UN two weeks ago, and I watched, well, also the warmth and the openness you, you have, and you, you were talking to everyone, which made the security a little bit nervous. But aside from that, you're, I, I watched all the leaders and policymakers watch you, knowing that you have been one of the wayfinders for all of us through this collision of circumstances, as, it, as it's been called, or this time. You've done extraordinary things for, to lead your, your country, and that has inspired many, many more to follow. And I think that what that speaks to is we've talked about explorers and exploration and all these qualities that are so critical, and one of those key qualities is the courage to have the courage to, to know where you're going and hold that island in your mind even when people around you think that that's a little bit crazy. There was a slide that was put up about the Palau National Marine Sanctuary that you established and it said in quotes, you know, ambitious but appropriate. And I'm sure there are a few other words that had been described, you used to describe it in the, in the past, but can you tell us about what, you know, what has driven you and what courage is it gonna take and where, where do we go, as, as Dr. Earl said, where do we go from here? Thank you and aloha. Uh, first of all, it really is an honor to be among these uh, explorers uh, who have dove a lot more and a lot deeper than this island boy who, um, who sometimes we think as island people that we, we've seen everything, that we know everything. But in fact, uh, we need to join the reality that there is so much we can still learn from each other, uh, from the ocean, from all the na natural elements that makes life possible for all of us on this earth. And, um, the Hukulea worldwide voyage may have started here in Hawaii and ended here in Hawaii, um, but I know that on that vaca were the spirits and the dreams the aspirations and hopes of every Pacific Island people. That it was important that the Hukulea exploration voyage succeed to prove that we, we mean and we need to talk about the ocean. That life and the ocean are inseparable that Pacific Islanders depend on the ocean, not only for navigation by the stars, but really our own culture, our own livelihood, our own way of life, our economies. Everything is, is essentially linked to the health of the ocean. And that's the, that's the message of the Huklea. That's the message of all Pacific Island people. That's the message of every small island developing state. And by the way, we should stop referring to ourselves as small island states. We are large ocean states. <laughs> so let's start thinking, let's stop thinking of ourselves as from the planet Earth. We're from the planet ocean. <laughs> and according to every island culture, the Earth is the mother and the ocean is the father. And that's the relationship that we all must equally uh, emphasize on. Now, Noah, if I may, let me just quickly narrate the story of this non-believer, this reporter from the U.S. mainland, who came here and wanted to get on the boat with Papa Mao Piaulu on one of his inter-island voyage. As a non-believer, he took a compass and hid it inside his backpack and got on the vaca. On the 18th day, unfortunately, they, they encountered a, a, a storm. And the storm knocked everything on board, including the reporter's backpack. <laughs> so what uh, was going to be a 20-day voyage, actually they were driven off course, so it became a 28-day voyage to Satawal. You can imagine the, this poor guy's desperation and after, beyond the 20 days, he started to lose hope. And so when they finally sighted land, sighted Satoal, he was jumping up and down on the vaca and said, Master Mao, Master Mao, you, 
you did it. You found Satawal. You found Satawal. To which the old man simply turned and said, Young man, we did not find Satawal. Satawal has always been there. <laughs> This trip will go down in history. It's a historic epic journey for the Nainoa and all the brave men and women, the courageous men and women who undertook this trip on our behalf. And the message really is that the ocean has got to be respected, that the ocean has got to be a focus of what we're all trying to do with all the rest of the 17 international or United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You cannot talk about poverty, addressing poverty without talking about the health of the ocean. You cannot talk about health without talking about the health of the ocean. You cannot talk about climate change and global warming and addressing that without addressing the health and condition of the ocean. So it is very, very appropriate that of all the 17 sustainable development goals that the United States has embarked upon, that we give due and rightful consideration to the status and health of the ocean. Who is going to lead this movement? Obviously, it has to involve all of us who are living on the ocean, literally living on the coastlines, literally, literally experiencing what it is about marine pollution, what it is about climate change, what it is about natural disasters, what it is about ocean acidification, what it is about coral bleaching. We are on the front line of what's happening if the world does not take action and address the health of the ocean. That's the message that the hukulea brought to the rest of the world. And we're happy that a great majority of the, of the world are now beyond the issue of debate. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise that we still, we still need to debate about this. No. It's a living reality for us. It's our future. It's the future of our children and their children. And for that matter, the future of the world as we know it. No life on this earth can exist without the ocean. That's the scientific fact. And so, what are some of the things that we need to do? Well, we know that we cannot continue harvesting, exploiting the ocean without providing some kind of a balance. It's the same thing with everything else. You put too much demand on anything, it will go out. And then what's the next option? Create another ocean or go to March and see if there's another ocean out there? No. We have got to balance what we're doing by also providing some marine protected areas network, by focusing on conservation, by focusing on protected areas. Because this is what our ancestors were doing. That's why we have the ocean as it is today. They were thinking about tomorrow. They were not just thinking of themselves. You know, conservation is not designating an area as a, a no-take zone and throwing away the key and said, oh, that's conservation. No. Conservation means respect. Respect for nature. Respect for the ocean respect for the land. Conservation is also about sustainability. Thinking that tomorrow, as a fisherman, I need to have fish. And therefore, I should not take everything that I come upon on today. And as a fisherman, my sons and grandchildren, they need to be able to find fish when, their is, when I am old. Uh, and no longer calling myself a fisherman. So it's all about sustainability. It's about respect. It's about making sure that the resources are there. 
Imagine 3% of the bluefin tuna now. 3%. That's all in our lifetime. So the next 10 years, there may not be any more bluefin in the Pacific. Less than 20% of the yellowfin are now uh, in the Pacific Ocean. 20%. The bonitos, the soras, uh, the tuna, they're the smaller size, but they are available about 50, 51 percent. But that's not a sustainable harvesting trend, for sure. Eventually, it will all die out. So these marine protected areas, this protected area network, envisioned by the Aloha Plus Challenge, by the Palau National Marine Sanctuary, by the Micronesian Challenge, of simply setting aside 30% of, of the ocean and 20% of your land terrestrials, that could go a long way. And that's the target of every United Nations, every, to do at least 30% MPA by the year 2030. And I think it's a legitimate and a needed target for everyone. But for Hawaii, we can feel happy about it. And I applaud the people of Hawaii. It's not just the Aloha Plus Challenge, but you have also become uh, a signatory to the Paris uh, Agreement as a state, and that's a good thing. <laughs> and I hope California is next and more states follow. Uh, wouldn't that be a good thing? <laughs> But as I told uh, President Obama in the IUCN meeting here, when the U.S. finally gets to 80%, welcome to the big boys club. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, that really is, the, uh, is my take on this. I, I just think that uh, at the end of the day, we are all in one vaca. We are all in one both with a common and one destination. And we need to paddle in one direction. That's how you get to your destination. We shouldn't be going backward. We shouldn't be going around. We should be paddling in unison because that's the only way we're going to address it. So if I may leave all of us with this chant, it's really important. And by the, I almost forgive me, but I want to introduce Nainoa's adopted brother and the son of Papa Mao himself, Cesario, who is with us in the audience. <laughs> so the chant is all about paddling or rowing in unison in order to get to our destination. And at the end of the chant, when I point to you, please say, way, which is like, yes. Ema the malaso yang alerub gledeng magnit yada talbaka ale engungil mandiang dago Mm. Thank you very much. God bless the children of the ocean. It's impossible to summarize this. Oh, Dr. Earl, did you want to say, make us another comment? Well, I we just wanted to make the observation that it took a thousand years before Navigators figured out how to sail upwind. And we don't have a thousand years. <laughs> we have to learn right now how to sail upwind against the forces that are really pushing against getting to a better place. And we can do it with leaders such as Tommy, leaders in this room. I wanted to also just bring one more ocean elder into the picture, and that's Jane Goodall. She, 
she gives she gives the following reasons for hope. One of them is the human mind. Oh, well, it's kind of special, and we should appreciate that, that we can figure things out, that we have the capacity to solve problems, to understand what other smart creatures on the planet have cannot. We have that special gift. We also have the gift of the human spirit, which was absolutely vital to the success of this worldwide voyage and our continued voyage into the future. The third reason for having hope is the resilience of nature. Oh, look at it. Over the history of Earth, there have been some vast shocks to the system, but none perhaps as great as one that is taking place right now especially because we're not talking about the forces of the, the natural world, we're talking about us, humankind, altering the nature of nature. With our eyes open, armed with knowledge, armed with spirit, we're still perversely seeming to move in a direction that is not favoring our future. But Jane Goodall's fourth reason is maybe the best and that is the kids, the children, who offer hope that we can change course, go upwind, get to a better place. And never before have we had a better chance to do that than right now. Thank you. Thank you. So with that summary, um, there's really no, no way I can, and it would be impossible to try to summarize that. I just want to say mahalo nui to each of you for making the time to be here, to be at homecoming. You've done incredible things for the planet, and you have joined us here in the celebration. More than anything, beyond your courage and your intellect and everything that you've done, just thank you for your deep aloha <coughs> that you have shown to the Voyaging Society, to Nainoa, to Hokulea, to the Pacific, and, and really to just planet, ocean, and our future. Aloha. Nice round of applause for our ocean elders and President Tommy Romengasau Jr. and Aulani Wilhelm. Mahalo al for wonderful facilitation.